New Mucinex Kickstart provides an all-in, one-and-done relief with a morning jolt of cooling sensation. From long commutes and early meetings to spin classes and school drop-offs, mornings are busy enough. Who's got time to tackle fevers, coughs, sore throats, congestion, headaches, or body pains? Not you. So come back with a kick. Buy Mucinex Kickstart at your local retailer. Use as directed. Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare, January 17th, only on Netflix. I'm Jason Pack. And I'm Alex Hall Hall. And this is Disorder, the surprisingly good podcast, as my husband describes it, where we try to make sense and order out of our mad, 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 mad world. And this week, we're going to look at what happens when the laws of a given country allow corruption to take place in plain sight. We're going to examine those cases where it isn't illegal to buy access to politicians or to buy subsidized goods cheaply and then sell them dearly. And the really interesting thing about this episode is corruption in plain sight. We're talking about this happening, not just in far-flung, underdeveloped countries around the world, but here in the UK as well. Alex. Most people think corruption is about illegality. It's about breaking the law and not getting caught. Of course, sometimes this can be what corruption is about. But a lot of corruption has always been hiding right there in plain sight. It's about bending the rules, exploiting the loopholes, using capture of key state institutions for private or collective gain. So one thing I want to use this episode to disentangle is these three separate notions, corruption, illegality, and institutional capture. What I want to explore about corruption is so many people think about it in terms of money, its bribes, its diversion of taxpayers' revenue. But for me, the really corrosive and poisonous aspect of corruption is what it does to a political system, and in particular, how it corrodes democracy and trust in public institutions. It's a big reason why people lose faith in democracy is when they feel that the system is gamed by a privileged few or insider elites. And I've seen it in so many countries I've served in around the world. For example, in Thailand, it's been struggling for decades to establish itself as a democracy. And pretty much every 10 years, the politicians are perceived to be so corrupt that the military uses it as an excuse to launch a military coup and take over power for themselves. And they claim they're doing it to preserve the state and get rid of the corrupt politicians. But the generals are just as corrupt as the politicians they ousted. And you get this poisonous, dangerous cycle. And it's that poisonous effect of corruption on democracy that is the most dangerous aspect for me. It is a dangerous aspect, Alex. I mean, there's the perverse negative feedback loop aspect. And to me, this is what makes corruption fundamental to the race to the bottom dynamics of the enduring disorder. I would call that a structural aspect of corruption. And we're going to hear a lot about that today. But there's also that human nature aspect of corruption. And this is if someone has an incentive to do something and can get away with it, it happens. If you can avoid paying your creditor and you're not punished for it, Or you can pay a lobbyist in D.C. who can create a regulation that benefits you or your business. 
If you can get away with it, someone's going to do this behavior. Maybe not everyone, maybe not even half of the people, but about 10%. And so the thing is, if you can't get away with it, or the costs of being caught are extremely high, that will cause deterrence. And what we've seen in the US and the UK is that over the course of my lifetime, they've become more similar to various developing countries, which is that the costs of engaging in the corruption are less, and then the deterrence is less. It engenders the corruption. Yeah, so I think the UK is a little bit different from the US. In the US, I think it's more about money, and it's a lot of money flushing through the system, and it's a lot of money, political party donations, which the Supreme Court has ruled as a form of protected free expression. In the UK, I don't think it's so much about the money. It's pretty cheap to buy access in the UK. Correct. Correct. In the UK, it's political corruption. It's influence and access, and it's a kind of cronyism. And what's happened in the UK in my lifetime is the sense of shame has gone. You were talking about corruption being human nature. People will do it if they can get away with it. But in the UK, I think, and I may be a bit naive here, that there used to be a sense that good chaps didn't engage in such ungentlemanly conduct. That's why we don't have a written constitution, because there were certain unwritten norms and conventions that good chaps were supposed to obey. And you never lied in Parliament. You just didn't do those things. And if you were caught out, you resigned. You did the decent thing. That has gone. And I really really blame the Conservatives for that. It has really developed under them. I mean, look at what happened with the Owen Paterson scandal or Partygate or the COVID contracts. And when caught out, they didn't resign. What happens now is ministers bluster. They try and brazen it out. They say it's just a witch hunt or they blame the media or they engage in whataboutery. But look what the other side is doing. And we've lost that sense of shame. So for me, it's not necessarily criminal sanctions that are going to clear up the British system. It's how do we tidy up that sense of ethics and morality in government? That's a fascinating and very sad observation, Alex. I think that The thing with culture is, is it takes hundreds of years to put together and you could ruin it in a decade and you're not going to put it together in the next 50 years. Hearing you speak, I was thinking of my favorite movie, Barry Lyndon by Stanley Kubrick. And you know, Redmond Barry, who is this Irish adventurer, and he's paying off various people to try to get himself ennobled. He's doing a fine job and he meets the king. And this is taking place in the 1770s or 1780s. He pays for a regiment of volunteers to be sent to the colonies to fight against American independence. But then he has a music party, like with chamber music at his manor. And the king and various lords are there. And his son mocks him and he beats the son in front of everyone. And after that point, It's not that anyone says you're a tyrant and an imposter. Rather, he invites the Lord of X to, would you like to play cards with me? And he's like, oh, let me check my diary. Oh, Wednesday next, I am busy. And then Redmond says, but what about two Tuesdays? Oh, it is a terribly busy time of year. I'm I'm so sorry, I cannot make it. And therefore, he has been ostracized from polite society because he beat his son in public, and therefore he can't have anything to do with the higher orders in England. And if we zoom back out, this is a sorry state of affairs, Alex. If you're Lady Moyne and you've ripped off the British taxpayer for 60 million quid for PPE that didn't work, she's not embarrassed. She goes to a Tory party event and everyone is like, great job. You really did this and you made a lot of money and we're so happy for you when you got a lordship or ladyship or something. That part blows my mind. And I think that those barriers to engage in paying for access or screwing the treasury, we're not going to be able to put them back into place very quickly, Alex. The shame is gone. Yeah, so Baroness Moan is the absolutely classic example of the absolutely shameless type that is now prevalent in our politics. Although I will say as a result of the 
public exposure of the dodgy contracts, I will say she's becoming a little less welcome in polite society. But yeah, I really like your point. It takes hundreds of years to build up a culture and in a manner of decades or a few years, so much damage has been done. Let's look at corruption and understand it from some different lenses. I think it'd be interesting to use this episode to analyze two wildly different cases of the interplay between corruption, culture, institutions. We're going to look at Britain and Libya. The UK is where foreign corrupt money is laundered on an industrial and global scale. And Libya is where the Miss Manners Guide to rigorously correct kleptocracy is written and then honed to an art form. There really is no economic system on earth which produces more sophisticated kinds of corrupt incentive structures than Libya. Sometimes I think, Alex, if I'm invited to the right billionaire's kid's 11th birthday party, what can I get him? That's not a problem I have, Jason. I never get invited to billionaires' kids' parties. The answer is you need to study your Miss Manners Guide to Rigorously Correct Kleptocracy, in which you learn <laughs> at a billionaire's male child's 11th birthday party, you give two British Virgin Islands shell companies one Cayman Islands shell company and a partridge in a pear tree. (laughs) All right. Well, I think our first guest on today's episode has expressed it differently. Here with our guest, Sam Bright, we're going to unpick how corruption happens in plain sight in the UK. He is an investigative journalist who's written for many respected outlets, the BBC, the New York Times, The Guardian, and he's the author of two books, Fortress London, Why We Need to Save the Country from Its Capital, and Bullingdon Club Britain, The Ransacking of a Nation. And I'm just going to give you a warning. This interview set my blood pressure soaring because It's just astonishing the kind of things that are happening in the UK in plain sight. So I began our interview by asking him, is it really too strong a word to say that it's corruption happening in the UK? Under the Conservative Party in recent years, our political system has been corrupted. And I'm not being partisan in that sense. But I think that there's been very distinct features of the way that the political system has been operated by the Conservative Party and how the Conservatives have allowed money. They've really created an institution of power whereby access can be bought. So they invite donations to the Conservative Party and in return for tens of thousands of pounds, and you get greater access to ministers. In that sort of system, you have got a corruption of democracy because you're no longer one person, one vote, everybody's equal in under democratic rule. You've got a system in which a few people with a lot of money to give to one political party have a whole lot more access and influence over public policy and over our democratic institutions than others. I mean, is this something that is just part of the current type of governments we've had recently under the Conservatives and a sort of succession of leaders with ethical challenges, shall we say? Does this cross all political parties? I mean, if there's an election and a change of government, do you think some of those similar forms of behaviour will persist? Because then you might be able to say, actually, it's not the system that's corrupted. We've just had a corrupt set of people who've abused the system. There's certainly a risk of the Labour Party falling into the same practices. There's been some great stories on lobbying firms paying for Labour advisors. So these big public affairs companies have placed advisors within the shadow cabinet, which is an extraordinary state of affairs. The fact that not only are these people seconded from the public affairs agencies to a political party, but their salaries aren't even paid by Labour. Surely that's a conflict of interest. 
That's amazing. It is absolutely incredible. There's three examples of this in, in recent history. One in Stark, Keir Starmer's office, one in the Shadow Business Secretary's office, and one in the Labour Chair's office. So these are, you know, relatively high, well, the highest positions in the Labour Party through Keir Starmer. And so you've got this risk, certainly, and especially considering how Labour's got a bit more of a volatile relationship with the trade unions than it did, for example, under Jeremy Corbyn. Keir Starmer has tried to compensate through a closer relationship with business. And whenever that happens, you run the risk of corporate interests potentially corrupting the public interests through lobbying, donations, etc., in the same way that we've seen through the Conservative Party. It sounds from what you're saying, it's sort of the way in which it's done. If it's sort of transparent and using appropriate channels like an official published meeting with a set of corporations, you're saying that firms are paying to embed their lobbyists inside government structures. So how do we draw the line here? When does it sort of morph from being an acceptable form of lobbying I mean, lobbying can be healthy for improving the quality of legislation or policy making. So where's the line drawn? It's a really tricky one. I guess the problem is, and that I expect it's something that you'll come back to often on this podcast, is the good chaps theory of British government. <laughs> <laughs> We're governed by people who uphold moral standards. And that system of government has entirely broken down in recent years. And so sort of the ethical framework with which British politics has been governed previously needs to be rewritten, I think, in a much more strict way, essentially, to protect us from the bad guys in government. And so I'd say transparency is great, and we certainly need more of that. The problem is it's essentially a judgment call. It's a moral judgment call as to how far, and a practical judgment call in terms of the operation of government, what is sensible for you to release. Labour would argue, for example, in the cases that I just described in terms of the lobbyists being embedded in its organisation, it publicly declares the secondment arrangements that it has with private clients. Therefore, you, you have a degree of transparency, it would claim. But that transparency clearly doesn't go far enough. I mean, something that I pay avid attention to is government meetings that are released on a quarterly basis. Now, you typically get, with the releases of this information, maybe four or five words max describing the purpose of the meeting. And often it can be described as general discussion. So you've got a meeting between, for example, the Energy Secretary and Shell, and it will be described as general discussion. And I would be strongly in favour of, within reason, releasing the minutes to every external meeting so that we allow journalists to peer inside what happens in these external meetings and we can get a proper sense of the lobbying that takes place. So I think, you know, there's a couple of examples, but I think on a whole swathe of issues, the transparency regulations that we have need to go further. And then on top of that, we've just got to draw a line at some point and say certain things we shouldn't allow Cash for access, for example, is something that I think should just be outright banned. As soon as you go into that terrain, it's a corruption, I think, of our democratic space. But overall, the takeaway is everything needs to be strengthened in one regard or another. So you said, well, cash for access should be banned. I mean, you've highlighted in your writing other ways in which activities that I feel must surely cross the line. And I, I, you've written about investor visas. I want you to talk about that as well. Yeah, I mean, the Golden Visa programme, I think, stands out as one of the most abused public policies in recent years. It was introduced under John Major following the collapse of the Soviet Union and then accelerated under David Cameron after 2010. And essentially, it invited people with lots of cash to pledge to invest in the UK. And in exchange, they would be given visas to remain in this country and the more that you pledged, the quicker your citizenship application was expedited. And <laughs> it's just remarkable. It is truly 
remarkable piece of failed statecraft because the source of this money wasn't really checked. So the government granted investor visas on the basis that a bank would approve the individual in question. But the banks considered the awarding of an investor visa by the government to be sufficient. So the government and the banks were pre-approving one another with neither doing the due diligence as to where the money was coming from. How many people are we talking about, roughly? We have nearly 3,000 people from 2010 to 2020. We also have, in terms of the number of Russian citizens given a golden visa, we've got about 2,300. So (laughs) a hefty chunk of people. There were 10 Russian oligarchs who used the golden visa route to get into this country who have now been sanctioned by the UK, who were allowed without any due diligence checks to process their cash through British financial institutions, to buy property in this country, to buy businesses in this country, to settle here permanently and to have Britain as essentially a safe haven to then go out and prosper in the wider world. And yeah, that's something that we see to this day in terms of the golden visa scheme following Russia's invasion of Ukraine was closed down, Okay, which you'd think would be a de facto admittal that it wasn't the most upstanding of schemes. But the fact is that these people are embedded. What are the sort of wider policy implications of these, even if we don't use the word corruption, this sort of grey area and potential conflict of interest between wanting to get the money for your own domestic political reasons or your own personal prosperity reasons and how that translates into our policy choices and how that might contribute to sort of problems at the international level. Can you draw that thread for us? Yeah, I I think there is certainly, in terms of climate change, there's certainly a thread there. There seems to be a pretty direct exchange going on between the UK and Saudi Arabia, so to speak. We've agreed to import their fossil fuels, which we've needed for a long time. And in exchange, we've provided some security commitments to Saudi Arabia, and they import a lot of our, our arms. And so that has an effect on climate policy for one, in the sense that as that relationship is entrenched, you've got a body of power, of diplomatic power, in the case of Saudi Arabia, leaning on the British government, perhaps not to divest as quickly. And you also have these fossil fuel powerhouses promoting their own false solutions to this crisis. In particular, I'm talking about carbon capture and storage, which has dubious merits, hydrogen power, which largely relies on using existing fossil fuel infrastructure to create a supposedly green fuel that is not as efficient as using pure renewables, though hydrogen does have its benefits. So that's a very direct sort of conflict of interest there. Defence policy, for one, in terms of the stance that we take towards Saudi Arabia and its foreign escapade in, in the Yemen. But I think even domestically at home, there are plenty of ways in which British public policy decisions have been influenced by big money. You just have to look at housing. And we're talking earlier about the Golden Visa programme. Where did they put their money? They put their money into the, one of the most stable assets in Britain, which is the housing market. Then you've got big property developers donating to the Conservative Party. That is another institution of support for the Conservative Party. And taken together, you create a system in which house building for the purpose of allowing people on at the bottom end of the market, so making it cheaper for people to buy and rent and us to build more social housing is not a government priority, sadly. The way in which our housing market functions now, and in particular in major cities, is luxury house building, creating safety deposit boxes for oligarchs to stow away their cash, and also providing big profits to private developers. So yeah, I think it has a fundamentally altering effect on on the way that British politics operates. One of the things that 
I certainly have found a bit frustrating is my sense that the British media, again, we've always had this great pride that British journalists are the best in the world, the BBC is the model. And I do feel that actually our international reporting is really excellent. But somehow when it comes to domestic politics, issues get seem to get buried. I mean, there doesn't seem to be this public awareness of these issues that you and I have been talking about. What's going on there? I think, sadly, part of the institutional failure that we have is that the media is part of the corrupt relationship between power, money and politics. And that's created through the very institution of the lobby. And the lobby describes the place in Parliament where political reporters can mingle with MPs and ministers on lobby terms, which means, you know, anonymously, and both the culture and the way in which that institution has been built means that political journalism relies on gossip quite heavily, anonymous briefings, it relies on journalists' proximity to power, and as a result, you're psychologically prepared not to call out the same ministers that are feeding you those bits of information that then go and make the front page. I think that all breeds a sense of like a a club, the Westminster Club. It bumbles around the edges, it points towards the problem, but never really calls it out in overt and strong ways. That would be one of my solutions, would be to change the lobby system and either open it up to beyond political reporters or just abolish it altogether so we don't have that, this gossip culture that we see in Westminster. After the break, how legal avenues and government-funded subsidies are used to generate immoral and unethical gains in Libya as well. Get out of the trenches of tedious tasks like managing order fulfillment and start growing your business with ShipStation. They'll help increase profitability by automating your workflow with their simple, easy-to-use dashboard. With it, you can pretty much do everything you need to quickly and easily. Update order information, print labels, compare rates, optimize shipments, and even set up automatic delivery notifications. And it doesn't matter where you sell. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify... ShipStation can integrate pretty much anywhere online. Another great thing about ShipStation, they can help reduce costs with industry-leading discounted rates from some of the biggest mail carriers. You might even be able to get up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So make this year your most profitable one yet. Sign up for your free 30-day trial at ShipStation.com and use the code SPOTIFY. That's ShipStation.com with the code SPOTIFY. This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare, January 17th, only on Netflix. Kick off 2024 with big savings at Blinds.com's Big Thank You Sale. We wouldn't be the number one online retailer of custom window treatments without you. So we're showing our appreciation with big savings on premium blinds, shades, shutters, and more. And with Blinds.com's 100% satisfaction guarantee, if your order isn't perfect, we'll always make it right. Shop Blinds.com's Big Thank You Sale happening now and save up to 45%. Up to 45% off at Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. Alex, corruption comes in many forms. Preferential access to state power, preferential access to state regulatory capacity, preferential access to advisors to the shadow cabinet, advisors to number 10. This is a form of corruption, and it is a cultural phenomenon that allows you to access it, right? Yes. It's about influence and access and the ability to influence 
government policy making, like on housing, as he said in the interview. And that has real impacts on people across the country. I mean, in the UK, we have this huge shortage of housing. The government is encouraging people to blame migrants. We're hosting too many migrants and we can't house them. But why is there this housing shortage in the first place? It's because all the money is going towards luxury, high-end housing. It's a place where people can launder their money and it's a place where property builders make their most profits, but it's not actually responding to the public need. I don't know if that's exactly corruption. I'm sure that the property developers do tend to vote NIMBY and Tory. Sometimes that's even Lib Dem in various constituencies to prevent more social housing. But is that corruption or is that just using the political wheels and mechanisms that exist? I mean, that's the interesting debate we're having. I think it is a form of corruption. It's a form of cronyism. It's a very insidious form where there isn't a level playing field for policymakers. Okay. The complexity is shown, which is that one man's lobbying is another man's corruption. And (laughs) it's the legality of the corruption that we have to consider unethical. Now, what I was hearing about British corruption from Sam Bright is that it doesn't have to be about brazen cash looting schemes. It's just about preferential access that the kind that Baroness Moan got. And it's like you said before the interview, we had structural incentives to be clean. And as soon as those structural incentives are gone, our human nature is the same as anyone else. People will do what they can get away with. And this is a really good pivot to our case study for Libya. And working on Libya for nearly 15 years, it's taught me so much about how the global economy functions. But there is no topic that Libya has taught me more than on the evil of government subsidies and the perverse non-market incentive structures. I couldn't be further from a libertarian, but I really understand the evils of socialism when it comes to taking certain goods, say petrol, say bread, say tomatoes, and making them below market prices. Because as soon as you make it below market prices, you create an unstoppable incentive for people to buy the cheap goods in location A, go to location B, and sell them for a greater price. So in our second interview, we're going to unpack how legal forms of corruption, of the kind we discussed with Sam Bright, operate in more detail in an extreme case like Libya. Therefore, I'm delighted to introduce an old friend someone who has many more experiences and insights in this field than pretty much anyone else I know, the famous Libyan entrepreneur and political commentator, Husni Bey Husni. I lived the first part of my life under the king and then under Gaddafi during the first 10 years of the Gaddafi in Libya. Gaddafi was holding a slogan of Libyan capitalists. At the time, he used it, of course, because uh, he was trying to Libyanize the economy that was controlled mostly by Italians. And he decided to um, get the Italians out of Libya, I think, in 1970-71. So he needed the support of the Libyan to do that. Also, at the time, the oil companies were were running the show. The uh, government uh, budget was covered by the taxes paid by the private sector. So Gaddafi, when he started, as uh, encouraging the private sector because he needed the private sector at the time. In the course of the next 10 years after 1969, yes, he was still encouraging the private sector, but all of a sudden, 1978, on the 1st of September, uh, he decided to, I wouldn't say nationalize. He did not nationalize like it happened in Russia, or it happened in any socialist state or in China. But simply he uh, instructed the people of Libya, the poor people of Libya, to take over the wealth of those who have it. Landlords uh, lost their lands, they lost their properties, lost their houses, to whoever were at the time leasing or renting them. Everybody lost his business overnight. So all of a sudden, I was a young man at the time. From being a wealthy family, you find yourself that you have nothing. Overnight. But it did last long until 1986 and the war of Libya in Africa. And so when the defeat of Gaddafi in 1986, he started opening up again to the private sector. But in the meantime, we had to find other ways of working. Could you tell us how transparency 
can come about in a place like Libya? What are the steps that we can do there? And what are the steps that we can learn from how to make transparency in the global financial system from what can be done in Libya? In a country where you have a money supply, 50% cash, talking about transparency is a little bit far-fetched. You can never trace where the money is coming from, where it is going. And if you go even and look at the uh, dollars sold in Libya by the Central Bank of Libya, you will find out that 45% are through debit cards. And the debit cards, if you go and track them, you will find out that the debit card is credited with $10,000 today. And six, seven hours later, the $10,000 are completely taken out, out of that credit card. How can you talk about transparency? You can never track 45% of that money because of uh, what's going on. So, yes, it would be great if the Libyans put their own house in order. But in the absence of that happening, and it's been 12 years since the 2011 revolution, what is the role the international community can play in setting the ground rules for the Libyan economy? Can it impose sanctions if various core banking standards are not met? Can there be carrots and sticks for compliance for various regulations? How, how do you see that? I don't expect much to be done by the world, put it this way. The world, all they care about is that, and here when I say the world, the West in, in particular, all they are interested in is a uh, relative tranquility in this part of the world because it's on the southern flank of NATO. So they don't want a mess there. But who rules this country? How is ruled this country? They don't care much. It's not to their interest. If it is ruled uh, by a mule or is ruled by a camel or is ruled by a, a saint, it's very secondary. While others simply do not want democracy to take place in a country such as Libya, their arch enemy is something called democracy. What about the international community having international institutions that deal with the economy? I was encouraged that Biden, for example, made a summit about taxation. He wanted to get the Irish to raise the corporate tax to the same level as other European countries. And he wanted to deal with the fact that Delaware in the United States has a different tax rate than, say, New Jersey. And to me, that doesn't make any sense because Delaware and New Jersey, they're right next to each other. What do you feel there can be in terms of institutions to deal with the structural gaps, you know? Is that a world where we we really can have an efficient outcome when the British Virgin Islands and Antigua and Delaware offer certain things that you can't have if you base your company in the country that you're from? If you ask me, I would tell you that I would like all the countries of the world to be like Delaware, treat them all the same way, and then find other ways in terms of financing the budgets of the governments, because after all, taxes goes to finance the budget of the government. Tax money is the worst spent money and least efficient use of money on earth. So this is the libertarian answer. How would you fund security and education through VAT or how would you try to fund it then? VAT, of course, is the best way because VAT is the more you spend, the more you pay. The less you spend, the less you pay. I think it's very equitable to put it on VAT. Okay, let's play a fantasy here. This is an alternate way of ordering the disorder and we're open to different perspectives on this program. It's not my view. I'm more of a status than you are, but I find it very interesting, this argument. Would it be possible to coordinate the Guernsey and Delaware solution for Poland and Lithuania and Chile? How would you start the coordination? Or would you just say it's a race and whoever gets there first will benefit so that the market forces will lead to coordination? The market forces would lead to coordination. I would love every country to be like Delaware and uh, New Jersey rather than uh, being like England or Europe or France in particular and charge people as they consume, charge them on a VAT basis. So the more you spend, the more you pay. If we move towards a kind of libertarianism with no tariffs, which I like, no taxes on income, which I don't like, who will police the terms of trade in this world? Will there be an international institution? 
Will there be just the market mechanism? How do you see that happening? Market mechanism. There will never be an institution. What about when someone comes up with a fancy investment product called a cryptocurrency exchange? He bases himself in the Bahamas. He takes people's money, and you can obviously understand who I'm talking about here. He lies to the authorities about the nature of the operation, and then he goes bankrupt and doesn't have the money to pay people back. That's criminal. That's completely another uh, issue. No, but I'm talking about international institutions. How do we handle the fact that Sam Bankman-Fried has gone to the Bahamas and he has entrapped, obviously, non-Bahamanian investors through a kind of Ponzi scheme? Don't we need international coordination to solve these kind of issues? People, they deserve what they get. That's a very bold statement, Hosni. That's it. So would you say that the investors at Madoff, some of whom were European princes, some of whom were my cousins, some of whom were investors in pension funds, some of whom were the Teachers Union of New Jersey, just some teachers. Did they deserve what they got when they lost their money? I'm very sorry, but probably not the person himself, because the person entrusted somebody else to manage his money. Who was the final one who was really embezzled? We know Madoff embezzled, but Madoff didn't talk to your uh, mother or to your uh, member of the uh, pension fund. He talked to the managers of the pension fund. So these are all criminals. And if they were prosecuted and put behind bars, probably this will, over time, will not happen. Why can't our governments do enforcement better and doing the international kind of cross-border aspects of financial regulation? That's the failure of the government that could not really vet and audit and make sure that these people are uh, really selling what they are selling. That's a, a government failure. But to come and say that, no, we shouldn't let anyone do this uh, activity just because we are afraid, that's foolishness. That's not going to happen. So just to wrap up with kind of ordering the disorder here, a low tax, low regulation, no subsidy, which we completely agree on, worldview, whereby markets and trust between individuals can be used to create more efficiency. And some people who choose to gamble, it's their responsibility. But if they trick or embezzle others, we need to have states who punish them for that. Yes? Absolutely. Otherwise, we will never end with wanting to create order. We create more disorder. So the government should be what governments are or should be doing. And that uh, regulating and making sure that the people stay within the regulation and catch the thief before he escapes from the room rather than chasing him up after he destroys the castle. So let's order the disorder, Alex. Husni put forward some really controversial points there, cogently. I mean, is eviscerating the state the way to get rid of potential state capture? Personally, my inclination is you need better regulations to fight the ability of malign actors to do regulatory capture. In other words, if you just have a free-for-all, malign actors will do regulatory capture. But I do get his Husni's point, which is that if the state is a whale and it just has so much blubber and the fat is just sitting there and you can just harpoon it to death and feast on blubber and inefficiencies and subsidies and handouts, that it might be impossible, no matter how much you pay law enforcement, to get the whale hunters away from it. And that if you slim down the fat and you make the whale a size of a goldfish, the hunters are no longer interested. I get that point. I don't think it's accurate because even a small country like Libya has a tens of billions of dollars in its budget, and you can't slim that down because people need roads and bridges and schools, so you just need to have the right incentive structures. But I do get his point that there are certain domains like things in procurement or certainly with subsidies that the mere existence of government excess is probably going to generate corruption. 
Yeah, so the Libya and the British cases are just such different extremes. I mean, the context is so different. I mean, Libya is an example of other countries I've worked in where, like India, for example, where there were these massive state subsidy schemes. And of course, that's a huge vehicle for corruption. And you get middlemen who siphon it off, or the money gets diverted, and it becomes this self-fulfilling scheme. And the civil servants, in fact, although India has many, many absolutely wonderful civil servants, it also used to be seen as a route to personal enrichment at quite a lot of lower levels. The other issue about Libya and countries where corruption is endemic is it becomes a survival strategy for many people. Correct. You can't get your kid into a good school. You can't get to see the doctor. You can't get the necessary paperwork to register your child's birth or a marriage unless you're willing to pay bribes along the way. I do want to jump in there. Libya doesn't have a problem with low-level bribes. Okay. In fact, it's completely the opposite of, say, Egypt. If you get a traffic ticket in Libya, you can't bribe the policeman. There isn't a culture of low-level bribery. It would be totally uncouth because it doesn't pass the Miss Manners guide to rigorously correct kleptocracy. Ah. In Libya, corruption needs to be sophisticated. And at the high-end level, we create a subsidy loophole which allows a militia to come into being who siphons off money. And then the militia pays us a kickback to stay in power and pay their salaries. Like that's a Libyan scheme. You don't bribe a guy to not get a traffic ticket. Ah, Okay. All right. Actually, the culture there isn't so different. It's a more sophisticated level. What I'm talking about is the comparison between, say, okay, Egypt, the kind of backsheesh just to smooth the everyday life. And if you're not willing to pay those bribes, actually, you're just your daily life is a struggle. I think what's interesting about the UK is I actually think on a macro level, the UK is not a corrupt society. No. It is not endemic in our culture, and not everybody is doing it. It is a very small, privileged elite, and not involving a huge amount of money. And that's why this recent scandal about the post office, the postmasters, and them being accused of corruption, has created such a load of outrage and backlash across the UK right now. Because postmasters, people who work in post offices, are the sort of quintessential, decent, hardworking British person, the last people on the planet you would expect to be corrupt. And meanwhile, you've got the corruption in plain sight of people being given peerages after giving donations, or placing lobbyists in political positions or buying visas in order to get access to the UK. And that's the kind of corruption that Sam was talking about. And that is very different from the kind of corruption when we think about paying back sheesh or bribes or buying contracts. It's not a question of tighter laws or more enforcement mechanisms. I mean, we have a pretty good police system. We have very good courts. We have independent press to expose these things. So it's not the laws in the UK. It's a kind but what of it is, ethical, ethical. What it is is one chance. set of rules applying to certain kind of people and another set of rules for everyone else. Yeah, and I think it's linked to our class system as well, actually. There's a sort of insider. We're sort of above it. I really do. And that's what Sam Bright's writing it, it sort of gets at. It's this kind of chumocracy, the sort of Bullingdon club. Correct. So my takeaway in terms of ordering the disorder is, yeah, in many countries, it is actually about strengthening the institutions of the state, making them resistant to bribes. I think it's different in the UK. It's a cultural elite phenomenon. Okay, Alex. So actually, this idea of some people being above the law and a class system and one set of rules for some people and another for another actually connects the Libyan and the British cases. Both would be stark examples of how the laws that are on the books, the economic structures that are on the books, the culture that's on the books, allows some people to get away with massively seeking influence and paying to pervert things or benefiting from loopholes, 
while everyone else goes about and does their job and just gets on with things and want to get their paycheck on time and whatever. You know what I mean? That there is a class of people for whom the way the game is played is this. Okay, so Jason, we've talked a bit about what possible solutions might be in the UK. What's the solution for countries where it's about state subsidies and the bloated state bureaucracy as the whale blubber fueling corruption? Is it the libertarian model? Do you share that view? Or Great is it question, regulation? Alex. I couldn't be further from a libertarian in that I want international institutions and international coordination and huge amount of government money spent on infrastructure and education and all that stuff that I love. But I don't want to see subsidies. And I think Husni is really on to something. I don't want deregulation because privatization causes crony privatization. But you can't be paying for a good or service to be artificially cheap in one territory when it's expensive in another territory. That's just a non-starter. Human nature is not going to change over time, and people are going to want to exploit that. And because human nature isn't going to change, corruption is going to be here, disorder is going to be here. I think listeners might enjoy my book, Libya and the Global Enduring Disorder, because in chapter four, I discuss the Libyan contribution to human civilization in terms of inventing more sophisticated forms of novel corruption mechanisms. So this idea of the Miss Manners Guide to Rigorously Correct Kleptocracy, and I show ways in which the Office of Development of Administrative Centers works to create hundreds of billions of liabilities to have all construction companies in the globe entrapped so that they need to work in Libya to be able to have preferential treatment to get their back payments. And you're going to want to read about it. So I think that the listeners should come check that out. Okay, so with that shameless plug for Jason's book, Libya and the Global Enduring Disorder, which, by the way, is a very good book, we come to the end of our show. Please follow us on social media or tap follow right now wherever you get your podcasts and you'll be notified when every episode launches. And you can read more about today's topic by visiting our show notes. Our producer is George McDonough. Our executive producer is Neil Fern. Thanks for listening. And I hope you have a corruption-free orderly week. <laughs>